Hi, and welcome to Bootstrap, The Lighter Side, where entrepreneurs who have grown successful startups from the ground up share their inspiring stories. In each episode, you'll hear from accomplished founders about starting a business, managing a runway, and raising capital on their terms. I am Melissa Widner, the CEO of Lighter Capital, a leader in founder-friendly, non-dilutive funding. Visit lightercapital.com to learn more. On today's show, I'm so excited to be talking with the CEO of one of Lighter Capital's portfolio companies, Mike Proust from Visible VC. Hey, Mike, it is so good to be here with you. Thank you for joining us from Chicago. Is that right? That is right. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. And Mike, you are the CEO and founder of Visible VC. Um, could we start off just by talking about what the company does? Visible, first and foremost, is a platform for founders. Uh, our mission is to give founders a better chance of success. And we do that in one of three ways. The, the kind of core way where we launched Visible was with investor updates. So uh, how do we help founders build beautiful and engaging investor updates that can leverage their, their current or potential investors? We've since layered on other uh, features like uh, fundraising tools. So managing a fundraising pipeline, sharing your pitch deck, managing a data room. And then we have a kind of our third part of the founder platform, which we call Track. It's all about tracking your core KPIs. So uh, we plug into tools that founders use, Google Analytics, QuickBooks, Xero, Salesforce, HubSpot, to help really automate a lot of the, the reporting that goes into um, your, your investor relationships. And then more recently, uh, we've built a product primarily for investors. So kind of the inverse of everything I just said, a way for investors to get data from portfolio companies, uh, understand how those companies operate and perform, and use that data kind of one of two ways, um, either for their own internal analysis and, and decision-making, or sharing some subset of that data with their investors and their limited partners. So yeah, I mean, in, in short, we serve uh, two kind of amazing folks, investors and, and founders and startups. Let's back up. You've got a great origin story. So you've been at this for a long time. We call this a startup, but you started it in 2014. So we're going on close to a decade now. And and I love the story of how you started because uh, out of a venture studio, essentially. But if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, I was uh, living in San Francisco at the time. I'm originally from the Midwest, but my first job out of school took me out to the Bay Area. Uh, and that company was, the, the first company was being acquired and I got to know uh, a lot of our investors and kind of key stakeholders throughout that journey. And at the time that company was being acquired, uh, there was a group coming together uh, by the name of now what's called High Alpha. High Alpha is a venture studio uh, and B2B SaaS enterprise investor and really kind of one, one of the pioneers in, in the venture studio game. So yeah, was it even was that even a term then venture studio? I'm trying to think when that became a term. I think that was after 2014. I mean, there was like labs and incubators and kind of spins, yeah. but there was uh, no no venture, quote unquote, studio. And so Visible was really kind of one of the initial products we built for ourselves, really. Like, hey, we're uh, operators, investors, and founders of ourselves, and was really the MVP for uh, what ends up becoming High Alpha. So there are some kind of temporaries of mine um, that also started companies kind of in this ragtag fashion, and then High Alpha became a thing uh, about a year later with some of the proof points of, of the companies that were started um, back in, in in that time. So founded out of a venture studio. Um, how was it initially funded? Yeah, so we raised a little bit of early funding from some angels from the venture studio itself. And then uh, probably around the time of Lighter Capital in 2017, uh, we said, hey, we are operating in very much like a, a great market. Um, serving founders and investors, but we believe that it's like not a venture backable market, which is ironic given the the space we serve. But uh, we said like we can make a really nice business here, but are we going to be the company that venture investors are looking for to return the fund, you know, multiple times? And we all felt that the answer was no to that question, and felt like, hey, we're best served uh, serving a very specific type of customer, not having to raise prices, not having to pivot, not having to go out of business like a lot of um, similar companies have done. And that's when we found Lighter because we're like, hey, how do we continue to finance the growth of this business, not only through customers, but uh, not traditional quote unquote venture capital. And so that's when we originally found um, Lighter back in 2017 and subsequently used Lighter Capital again, actually um, at the end of 2022. 
Okay, so a little capital, a um, little dilutive capital, and then really growing through revenue and then some non-dilutive capital with lighter with lighters money, which is great. So I imagine you still own a, a big chunk of the company. You don't have to disclose percentages, but. Yes, I have plenty of options, which I love. Um, I love optionality. I love taking bets and in, in, in the intersection of those two things sometimes do and do not overlap. But um, I feel like I have the best kind of possible finance stack right now for visible, which is that I'm able to really put all of our, you know, cash flow back into growth, um, able to raise additional cap cash flow to accelerate that growth, but not having to dilute ourselves, employees, current shareholders um, by raising uh, venture capital. You sell to two different groups that yeah. are related, but really different in terms of, I would imagine how you would go about selling to them. One, has doesn't have a lot of money entrepreneurs and the other venture capitalists have to be you know i don't know maybe the worst people in the world i was a venture capitalist for a couple of decades the worst people in the world to sell to not not as people themselves but just as organizations you know they're it's it's not even necessarily clear who the entry point is i think about like when, when i was a venture capitalist and looking at companies you know i thought okay selling to doctors that's difficult lawyers difficult schools difficult but venture capitalists forget it but you've been really successful you have hundreds of venture capital firms using your product so so let's start with the vc side of the business how did you how did you sell to them and and convince them you know they have no budget for for technology yeah. to write you a check and and continue to write you a check every year yeah, that was our original thesis and how we started the company was let's sell this product to investors and then they have tentacles obviously into all of their portfolio companies and then we can get their companies to use it. Um, and what ended up happening is we had some level of success. So like that problem and the problem we solved resonates, but then we would have to sell an investor challenging persona to sell to for a lot of reasons. One, uh, there's a lot of noise in their just day-to-day -day life. They have their existing portfolio companies are supporting uh, thousands of inbound emails, likely every single month from potential portfolio companies. And then you kind of have like the vendor aspect too, which is the bucket we fell under. So we have to be always very clear, hey, we're trying to, to get your business not from you investing in Visible, but for you becoming a customer. And, and then uh, a lot of times investors, when they're starting to look at Visible, they're starting to look at the, the product through the lens of an investment, not as a customer. And so then it becomes really muddled and challenging. And then where does the budget come from if I'm running a small fund? And then not only that, we have to convince all of the portfolio companies to also engage and use Visible. Um, and so we actually pivoted out of that model with all those challenges. We're like, man, this is tough. Um, but what we did find uh, was that there was a huge problem around founders don't update their investors. Um, they don't know what to say, how to say it, when to say it. A lot of founders are first-time founders. Um, there's no playbook written for this. Um, your investors and keeping them up to date is like one of the most critical things you can do to ensure future fundraising success. And so we really said like, hey, that's going to be our initial wedge in this whole space is let's just nail the investor update. No one's doing it. Um, no one. And there's a ton of opportunity there. So we we didn't have to change a lot of the product when we pivoted. Uh, but we changed the go-to-market motion, which is we don't care about investors anymore. Other than that, we want to make sure they're getting updates. They look great in email, um, but we're not really concerned about them from a customer standpoint. Let's really focus on the founder experience because if founders find value in something, investors will follow. Like that's something I've learned is that in, like, investors will always kind of follow what the, the founder wants. And so we really made a big bet on investor updates and we made a big bet with organic um, search. So we just started writing blog posts about problems we were facing starting a company, figuring that like, hey, our audience are also founders and they'll probably search for these things. And that's how we really found the initial product market fit was someone's going to search in Google total addressable market template. So someone asked me that once, like, what's your total addressable market? And I was like, I have no idea. And I put together a template and then I just turned it into a blog post so anyone could reuse the work I already did. Um, and that kind of kicked off our initial growth. And so uh, on the founder side, you know, thousands of customers and a ton of that is coming from organic search and the content that our team is creating that's super helpful for founders and doesn't cost anything. 
And then through all of this, we found success with that. You know, last month, over 150,000 investors received an update from Visible. And so now what's happening is that there's kind of this viral component kicking in where investors are getting updates from Visible, seeing, you know, depending on the plan the founder is on, at the bottom of the email, it might say powered by Visible, or the investor can click a thumbs up and they're kind of brought into back into the Visible world. And now we're getting investors knocking our door saying like, hey, I want all my companies to use this. They kind of see how it could actually work for their portfolio companies. And so there was enough of that, like for a long time, for probably a couple of years, we're like, no, not for you, not for you, not for you. And we couldn't resist it anymore. And what happened is now we have thousands of companies, tens of thousands of companies sending updates. And right, we kind of solved some of that problem, like will companies use Visible? Um, we also changed the product and go to market where we're not pitching investors cold anymore. Um, the product is more or less bringing us leads for the investor product uh, is, is really a big way where investors are finding out about us. And then organic search, kind of, kind of same thing. And so, um, yeah, we relaunched the investor product in 2020, kind of hopefully with all the things we learned from the first girl around, and it's been super successful since. So yeah, we, we changed the product, go to market motion on that, but that's more of a traditional call it. You need to sit a demo. Uh, you work with our success team. We'll get you implemented. The founder product is more straight up self-serve. You get a free trial and you become a customer or you don't. On the founder side, it's really interesting. It really spans as a core customer though, is someone call it with 10 to 15 employees who've raised a couple million dollars would be like the sweet spot. Um, but we have people that are just getting started trying to figure out how to raise money for the first time. Uh, we let you manage a fundraising pipeline and share your pitch deck with your brand and track all of the engagement there. So it's really people that are just getting started all the way to we've had people use this well right before they've gone public and have used visible. The, the person might change where, you know, if it's not the CEO coming every single week to pen an update, it might be the head of finance or CFO or COO. The CEO will come in and, you know, make some ch ch uh, changes and tweaks and hit send. But uh, yeah, we kind of see visible has gone through the, the growth curve with a lot of founders now that we've been around for a while. Um, and then in terms of pricing, yeah, it's anywhere from 59 bucks a month to 200 bucks a month, just kind of depending on, you know, what you need. We have like the good, better, best uh, pricing model. And then we are about to launch very common in, I know, Lighter. Uh, we have a perk with Lighter and a lot of other venture funds or folks that work with our founder type customers. Um, we're going to offer a, a plan that's not publicly available, but like a free plan for those folks that are just getting started. Um, they don't have any cash in the bank yet. They're more or less bootstrapping this until they get um, funding or, or recurring revenue. And so we're going to have like a very pared down kind of lightweight version that helps you with sending updates to those potential investors, managing your fundraising pipeline, might not have all of the fancy bells and whistles, but should hopefully solve uh, a lot of pain points for you as you, you start your founder journey. Yeah. What What's the toughest thing to get founders to jump into this? Is it getting them over, you know, sharing their data that, you know, they're worried is... Uh, confidential and they want to control the distribution. I mean, they do get to control the distribution with your product, but but what, what's been the most difficult part of the sales cycle? I think there's probably two that come top of mind. One is just workflow or, or change management, right? It's another tool I need to, to learn and use. Uh, I might be comfortable with email already or however else I'm communicating. Um, and then I think the second, which is more education, uh, and it's something we, we're really trying to educate too, is like a lot of times things are not going well for startups. And so you're scared to share bad news. And so really it's more like, I'm just choosing not to share because there's a million things going wrong in my company. And what we're trying to let founders know is that like, that's the case for almost every single startup. And, and by the way, like that's why investors are investing is so they can help you figure out the solutions to those problems. Um, and that's okay to share bad news. But my, my guess is that there's a lot of kind of anxiety or just like fear of sharing bad news. Um, and so you, I mean, the data, the, all the data we have says that like, yeah, over 70% of companies are not sharing an update on a monthly basis. So um, I'm saying like, so you know, to our audience, that's a huge arbitrage opportunity. That means like two thirds of an investor's portfolio or more are not updating them regularly. Like there's a huge opportunity for you there to stick out. Uh, you can get more um, portfolio support. Uh, your likelihood of following an investment uh, is like 300% more likely if you're sending those updates out. And so I think those are the, the kind of the two main reasons why, why founders are you know, maybe not adopting Visible right away. Once they've adopted it, how much work are they doing to send out that monthly update? 
Yeah, I'd say it's probably like 30 minutes a month, you know, depending on how thoughtful or automated you want to be. I send a weekly one out that takes me two or three minutes. The longer time has elapsed since your last update is directly proportional to how hard it is too. It's like right. writing a blog post, right? It's like, yeah. if you wait a quarter, it's going to be hard to sit down in front of a blank page and be like, oh my God, what do I say? Um, but yeah, I'd say like 30 minutes on average because um, I think like the best updates, yes, are very quantitative, but they also like tell some sort of story or have some sort of qualitative information that kind of highlights what, what's gone well or hasn't gone well in the past month. I think the other thing too, like intangibles are like, it's actually really a, a great chance of like forced reflection for you as a founder or a CEO. Um, like I find that, you know, this morning, for example, I had like just an awful morning. It was just like problem, 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 problem. And I'm like, man, that was a tough morning. Um, but then like the end of 30 days, we reflect back and like, man, we did so many great things. Um, so for me, it's like actually finding like the greatness of what we did in the last 30 days, what was accomplished, um, whether that's, you know, marketing campaigns, product launches, um, customer success. Like for me, it's really a chance for for reflection of what went well, what didn't go well, uh, maybe what are things I want to start doing. Yeah, that, that actually is a, a really good topic to go into. Where do you get your energy? One of the toughest jobs in the world is startup founder. Where do you get your energy? You've been doing it for nine years now. So where have you, where do you go to get that? Yeah. One one quick aside that just resonates with me. Um, I, Mike Fitzgerald, he's a, one of the partners at High Alpha. And he, I was talking to him about this idea of like a, a really bad day versus a very great day. And I actually wrote a, a blog post about this called The Double Down. And the idea behind it is when things are going great, that's the day you work until midnight and you go and keep doing it because like everything's going the right way. Just keep that momentum going. And the day where everything goes to complete shit, like close the laptop, go do something completely different, like unplug. And I, I find that that works. In terms of my energy, I love talking to customers. And I I think like most founders uh, are, are geared this way, like natural problem solvers and curious. And this year I've tasked myself with talking to a paying customer every single day. So my goal is to talk to one customer every day and just hear their voice, hear what's going on in their world, uh, what works well. I have like, uh, I definitely have ego problems. So I, I always like to hear what we're doing well. Uh, but then I also want you to say like, what are, and I actually think that's important too, because like, all right, uh, what should we keep doing? Uh, but then I also want to hear like, where is visible not working for you? And I get so much energy from that because we come back with like great insights we might've missed out on by not talking to customers, uh, great insights of what we should definitely keep doing. And that's where I get a ton of energy. I get a lot of energy Really now, uh, you know, Visible, there was a small team for a long time and now we just hired our 15th person. And um, for me, it's like more team and culture building uh, now. And that's been fun where I'm, you know, not in the the super day-to-day -day anymore. Um, I'm a kind of a step above that. And it's fun to be able to work with an amazing team that's fun to work with and kind of teach them all the things I hopefully learned or didn't learn and the mistakes I've made. And that's been uh, very energizing. I think, honestly, it's like routine for me. Like, I, I think keeping a routine, he, just for my my personal day-to-day -day and just like my work-life harmony and everything that's going on, and I try to preach out to the team as much as possible, too, um, is like the the intersection of work and life is, I think it was, it was blurred well before COVID, and, and COVID kind of completely blurred all of those things. Um, so I think like routine is... Uh, huge. Uh, I think asynchronous communication is uh, a huge, probably overlooked tool for a lot of businesses. Like I think we're so used to like pinging someone, picking up the phone, tapping someone on the shoulder saying, hey, I need your attention right now. And I think when you're forced to communicate with someone asynchronously um, and have to articulate a thought, uh, it actually makes all kinds of critical thinking a lot more clear. And then I think like uh, other thing I love to do is completely throw the routine out the window. Like once a uh, quarter traveling or getting the team together for an offsite and like completely just getting out of the normal rigor of a routine and maybe the rut that comes with the routine and completely shaking it up and doing something else. And so I think that's the other thing that really helps and energizes me is um, like getting out of the routine meeting the team in person, meeting customers face-to-face, -face, um, having an awesome company offsite. So um, those are other things that I think help a, a lot. 
lighter went remote, like a lot of companies did after 2020. So, I mean, in 2020, when COVID hit, but you've been remote since 2014, since the beginning. Yes. So, so tell us, you, you would have all kinds of insight in how to make that work. Because we were looked at like super odd back in, in 2014 when we did that. And that was um, from one of our original kind of founding engineers. He was based in Montreal and he's like, remote work is going to be the future. This is how we're going to be able to find great talent. Uh, that is true. Um, and that's the best decision I think we, we have made. And, and we've been fortunate to hire some amazing people all over the world. Um, and I think the benefits of remote work and how we've gotten into work, I mean, it's certainly changed. It continues to change. You continue to try new things. Uh, but it's really all about communication. And I think when you think about where culture struggles or where some businesses or teams struggle, it's a lack of communication and transparency. Um, people don't know what they're supposed to do. Like, what is the main objective I'm trying to do? I didn't know someone was working on this thing. And I think with remote work, uh, by default, you're required to be great communicators. Um, about your status. What am I doing? Um, what am I working on? What am I thinking about? I think that's been really just part of the visible culture since we started was doing, you know, the, we do an asynchronous uh, check-in every single morning. We built like a very simple Slack bot that every morning it just kind of pings everyone and says like, hey, what are you working on today? Are you blocked by anything? And everyone just comes in and usually writes a couple bullets on here's what I'm working on, here's what I'm blocked by. And then on Monday, um, it always asks, what are your kind of three priorities for this week as well? So on Monday, it's just like, here are the, the top three things I know I want to accomplish uh, this week. And I think that really helps because it's like, when you write something down, you're way more likely, you know, to, to accomplish it. And so that's how we're doing the asynchronous check-in. Um, and then we have plenty of like real-time collaboration throughout the week. So every Monday morning at 10 a.m. Chicago time, uh, I'll do a team kind of kickoff. Hey, here are all the amazing wins from last week. Here's what we're going to be focused on this week. General news, metrics of how we're tracking for the month and quarter. We'll do a product meeting. Uh, we'll do a marketing meeting. And then on Thursday, we do something completely, usually fun. I'd say like 80% of the time, it has nothing to do with visible. And it is more like uh, we've been really into like creating our own Jeopardy boards recently. So we'll play Jeopardy as a team. So um, that's been a, a big part of our uh, team building and, and culture as well. Well, what advice would you give yourself nine years ago? What do you wish you knew then that you know now? And what would you have done differently, if anything? Yeah, I, I think for me, I don't know if this is cliche or not, but it's trust your gut and trust your gut faster. Um, mm -hmm. I think like there's so much advice out there, so many people willing to give bad advice, I find. And um, I think I've been fortunate to show myself with a lot of amazing people who give me great advice. But I think at the, all, at the end of the day, being the founder or CEO is like incredibly lonely. And really it's, it's, it's your shot and your call. No one's gonna make the decision for you. I think like before I was like hoping people would make certain decisions for me um, or I'd find, find myself trying to get as much input to, to kind of find a decision. Really, it's, it's on you. And so I think for me, it's like, yeah, learning to trust your gut faster. And I still probably don't listen to my gut as fast as I should, um, but I've certainly gotten faster. Um, you know, that could be a bad hire. That could be a tough decision to make on, do we prioritize X or Y? But I, I find that like, yeah, my biggest thing is that it's lonely, storing yourself with great people and um, trust your gut faster. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. We love what you're doing. We're so glad to support you on the journey. And um, I just, I want all of our customers and prospects to use this. So I would love to that too. Ways to, you know, get this more visible among, you know, not just all of the, you know, um, 500 plus companies Lighter has supported, but just all the ones that come to us because this is such a great tool and it's free when you start. So um, yeah. let's spend time and figure out how to make that happen. Well, thanks so much for having me, Melissa. Uh, you guys have just been an amazing partner to me and uh, really appreciate everything that you guys have done. Like I literally wouldn't probably be here without you guys. So thank you. Thanks again to Mike Cruz, CEO and founder of Visible.vc for joining Lighter Capital on Bootstrapped. For more information on Mike and his company, you can visit Visible.vc. That's V-I-S-I-B-L-E.vc. Ready to fuel your future on your terms? Subscribe to Bootstrap the Lighter Side. 
You'll get ideas for growing your startup from other successful founders who grew their businesses without giving up equity or control. This podcast can be found on Apple and Google Podcasts or directly at lightercapital.com slash podcast. Until next time, keep your runways long and keep those lights on.